Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We start tonight with the escalating conflict in Ukraine, where a massive Russian military convoy is gathering north of the capital, Kyiv, while civilians in the southern city of Melitopol faced off with Russian military vehicles. Some threw themselves on the ground to block the Russians' path through the city. The protesters who had marched from Victory Square when they came across the Russians. The, Ukrainians who shot, the Ukrainian who shot this footage says citizens plan to stage protests in the city every day over the noon hour. People are lining up to get weapons in Kyiv, including foreigners. This is not important. I am not in Ukraine, I am Turkish man. When I am uh, living in a uh, uh, country, for me, not important. This is my place. This is not important. I have work, I have life, I am living in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government has urged residents to volunteer and defend the capital from Russian attacks. President Volodymyr Zelensky is saying today defending Kyiv must be the highest priority. And thanks to our CTV colleagues for that ongoing coverage. Meanwhile, Kukum scarves have become a trend on social media to show solidarity between Indigenous peoples and Ukrainians. One woman in northwestern Ontario is doing what she can to help raise funds for the crisis in Ukraine. Our Daryl Stranger has that story. Tanya Cameron has been searching far and wide across Canada to buy Ukrainian scarves for Indigenous women in Ontario and Canada. Proceeds from the sales of these scarves will be donated to help those in Ukraine. It's, it's a lot of um, women that want to stand in solidarity with Ukraine. We are watching the news coverage of um, parents putting their children on trains and buses to leave the city. We're watching young people stepping up, taking up arms to protect their country. And, and it's, it's really emotional. And if this in small way where Indigenous women can stand with their cooking scars with, with, um, with Ukraine, then I think this is a beautiful thing. Cameron says she's been able to purchase around 150 scarves from various stores and vendors. One seller she reached out to was actually in Ukraine and unable to complete the order due to the current situation. One of the shops Cameron bought scarves from is Svitich Ukrainian Export and Import in Winnipeg. The owners are a husband and wife, and their family is still in Ukraine. They say they were touched when the scarves were bought. This was a, such a wonderful gesture from a community from Kenora to come down and as a solidarity to purchase Ukrainian Hustka to wear and support us in this fight. So I'm really uh, touched, I'm moved, and it's a, such a wonderful feeling that you're not alone with uh, this terrible fight with the enemy. So I um, really appreciate that. Cameron is also holding an online raffle through social media with Ukrainian and Indigenous clothing and accessories. All proceeds from the raffle will go towards the Ukraine Humanitarian Crisis Appeal. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The Cap Bueno First Nation announced today in Edmonton the 169 possible burial sites were found on the St. Bernard's Indian Residential School and the Gruard Mission in Northern Alberta. The school and mission was open from 1872 to 1961. Working with the University of Alberta, ground penetrating radar detected 129 probable remains, 32 possible remains and 8 likely remains in the one acre that has been searched so far. More scanning will take place in the coming weeks. The university said that 107 probable remains were found in the school cemetery. These were not schools. They were institutions established to kill the Indian in the child. And as the number of children found in graves continues to climb, we see it was never about erasing who we are, but eradicating us altogether, genocide. And we'll have more on this story tomorrow. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 
A delegation of Indigenous peoples is traveling to Rome at the end of this month, where they will meet with Pope Francis. A Mi'kmaq residential school survivor is part of that delegation. Phyllis Gugu will have 10 minutes to share her experiences at residential school. APTN's Angel Moore has more. This is the closest most people will get to the Pope, waiting in a crowd for him to appear at a window. Few get a private conversation with His Holiness. But residential school survivor Phyllis Gugu of Waigogama First Nation will get that opportunity. She went to the Shubenacadie Residential School from four years old to 14. She remembers the abuse. You could hear children crying because they're constantly being strapped, you know, you're out of line or something, or something went, someone went their bed and they get beaten for it. In her 10 minutes, Google will speak of the impacts of residential schools. I saw so much in residential school that it haunts me sometimes, you know, thinking about other children, what I saw. There was a lot of different kind of abuses. Gugu would like an apology from the Pope for the Catholic Church's role in the abuses at residential schools, and she hopes the visit will be healing. But the discovery of unmarked graves brings back the pain. When they discovered the mark, unmarked graves, it, it, it got me bad again. I was uh, right back to where the hurt was. You know, thinking about the children, what they went through, you know, to die in the residential school. And the First Nations delegation is scheduled to arrive at the Vatican at the end of this month. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabukduk, also known as Halifax. Time to step aside for a quick break, but first a look at a story we're working on. Arnold's experience plays a key role. I'm Tamara Pimentel. A birch bark canoe he made with his father over 60 years ago becomes a part of Alberta history. Like birch bark canoe. In those days, I didn't even think of coming back to that history. Now, Al Zero Or wants to pass that knowledge on. I'll bring you that story soon on APTN National News. Welcome back. Water woes continue in Nunavut's capital, Kaluit. The city issued a boil water advisory today. The move is being called, quote, precautionary and came after valve repair caused the system to lose pressure. According to a city press release, residents are advised to boil water for a full minute before using. The Calouite has had ongoing water issues after fuel in the water supply shut down the system for two months in October. A new report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change takes a look at the imminent impacts of the climate crisis. But amidst the doom and gloom, there are suggestions on how to reduce risk. And that relies on Indigenous people and their knowledge. Here's Annette Francis with more on the report. Elizabeth Gilmer is the lead author of the IPCC report released this week. This is a very stark report, and it outlines many irreversible impacts. This report also points to the urgency of taking action and that many of these actions can be taken by each and every one of us. Gilmer says the urgency is in relation to the types of irreversible impacts that we're seeing in Canada now, like permafrost thaw, flooding and wildfires. Chapter 14 of the report focuses on North America and Indigenous people are key to lessening the effects of climate change. According to the report, there needs to be more meaningful dialogue and support for the impacts of climate change and adaptation methods, including Indigenous knowledge, communication and outreach, as well as collaborations to co-create equitable solutions are critical for successful climate action. But Indigenous people are also most vulnerable to climate change, which has had an impact on their food and nutritional security. 
loss of availability and access to marine and terrestrial sources of protein has impaired food security and nutrition of subsistence dependent indigenous peoples across north america the report states the risks to north america are expected to intensify rapidly by mid-century the Green Party's parliamentary leader, Elizabeth May, says things look dire. We're at 1.1 degrees Celsius now, global average temperature increase. And I can tell you, as a British Columbian, we were not safe this year. My stepdaughter, my husband's youngest daughter, nearly died in the heat dome, and she's young. We lost nearly 600 people in four days in British Columbia. Lytton burnt to the ground before you could get the fire truck out of the fire station. And then we had the floods. It's not safe now. And we're In spite of the gloominess of the report, Gilmore remains optimistic, but only if people and governments listen. But the report tells us that there are numerous actions that we can all take. These actions need to start now. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. The chief of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations has responded to criticism leveled at the organization by longtime Senator Roland Crow when he resigned just over a week ago. Crow cited a number of reasons for his resignation. Those reasons included a total loss of principles at the organization, disrespect of women's staff, and failing to protect treaty rights. FSIN Chief Bobby Cameron denied the accusations and said the former senator has the right to his own opinion. It's something that we prioritize in securing that our children come home implementing Bill C-92. Uh, we're doing our best to influence the federal budget to develop and create and build more houses on reserve, implementing that treaty right to shelter. You know, those, those are important items and we continue to focus on those and you know, um, uh, Roland Crowe has every right to speak his mind. You know, we, we respect him for that. A two-spirit member of the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation in New Brunswick has been trying to get band membership for his son Jackson for years. Because his twin boys were created by in vitro fertilization, one of his sons does not share his DNA. But as Amelia Fournier reports, the band requires a paternity test for membership. I am their father with every part of my soul and being. In light of the current membership code, only one of my sons is allowed to be a member of our community. This is Wayne Wallace reading a letter reaching out to his community in the hopes of convincing the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation to give his son Jackson membership. His eight-year-old fraternal twins are both registered under the Indian Act, but only one is a member of his band. For me, it's really important that Jackson is accepted as a member of our community because he is, for all intents and purposes, a member of our community. He is my descendant. He is my son. Wallace lives in Vancouver, but regularly visits Madawaska, a community adjacent to Edmonston, New Brunswick. Wallace's father lives there, and he still considers it home. In 2014, there was a referendum that added a DNA test requirement for paternal offspring to become members. Jackson shares DNA with Wallace's husband, so he's not considered a member. In the first, very first sentence, it says that our code was done in keeping with Maliseet customs and traditions, and it isn't. Wallace spoke with Maliseet elder Andrea Bear Nicholas of Tobik First Nation, who confirmed that using DNA lineage to determine membership went against historic Maliseet values. It was well known back in history that if an unwanted child um, uh, was delivered or brought into one of the Maliseet community, that child was brought in and raised as their own. When APTN last spoke with Wallace in 2020, he had filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. In October 2021, he decided to withdraw his complaint and embark on a mediation process with his community. I'm hoping that through dialogue we can come to um, an understanding of as Malisi people who we, we were and what we did with regards to kinship. 
Wallace says the chief and council told him to reach out to the community and allowed him to use the council's social media accounts in preparation for a future referendum. Chief Patricia Bernard confirmed with APTN News that the chief and council are remaining neutral on the situation and will act in accordance with what the members of the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation decide. I feel like we've lost our way in certain respect when it comes to custom and tradition. No fault to our, our own because essentially that's what happened through, through simulation. Wallace hopes that when he returns to Madawaska with his family, Jackson will feel accepted. It's not about money. It's not about, uh, it, it's about the sense of community and the sense of belonging that I feel and that I want my children to feel. Emilia Fournier, APTN News, Montreal. Time for another quick break. Coming up, we'll meet some innovators of the North. We finally come to that point and hopefully other um, Native women will take up flying because I've heard from other ones before that they're interested in stuff. So hopefully they can uh, maybe look to it one day a bit more seriously. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And with the sun low upon the horizon, this is from our viewer Letitia Wrangle. This was the view from Westboro, Ottawa, looking across the Ottawa River. Beautiful looking shot. Be sure to email your photos with all the details to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, plus 4 in Halifax, minus 2 in St. John's. 17 below in Nain, snow and 10 below for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 4 in Montreal, minus 15 with snow in Shibugamu. Minus 6 and snow in Sault Ste. Marie, 5 below in North Bay. Snow and minus 6 in Thunder Bay, sunny and 12 below in Sioux Lookout. Minus 16 with the sun out in God's Lake, Norway House in the Paw. Minus 10 in Winnipeg, 11 below in Dauphin. Minus 10 with snow for Regina, sunny and 14 below in Saskatoon. Minus 15 in Meadow Lake, minus 16 in La Ronge. In northern Alberta, minus 12 in Fort McMurray, 3 below in Grand Prairie. Minus 7 with snow in Edmonton and Red Deer, minus 4 in Medicine Hat. Plus 11 in Vancouver and Victoria. Plus 4 with snow in Prince George. Minus 4 in snow in Dees Lake. Minus 16 with snow in Old Crow. Minus 1 in Whitehorse. Minus 21 for Yellowknife. 14 below in Norman Wells. Minus 19 in Saks Harbor. Snow and minus 13 for Polituck. Minus 22 in Baker Lake, Chesterfield and Whale Cove. Minus 18 in Resolute, 20 below in Joe Haven. Some notable First Nations people in the Yukon were recently recognized for their exceptional, innovative spirit and contributions to the territory. Here's Sarah Connors with the Yukon Hall of Innovators, most recent inductees. In 2020, Shadenyan Van Campen became the first Yukon First Nations woman to earn her single-engine commercial pilot license. I'm happy it's, we've finally come to that point and hopefully other um, Native women will take up flying because I've heard from other ones before that they're interested in stuff. So hopefully they can uh, maybe look to it one day a bit more seriously. Van Campen is in the early stages of becoming a bush pilot and works as a truck driver. I'm really excited to share that this year's Youth Innovator Award goes to Zhedan Yan Van Kambin. So That's how the 23-year-old Champagne and Ajax citizen came to be nominated for the Youth Innovator Award, provided by Innovation Hub Uconstruct and the Department of Economic Development. This is the second year Uconstruct hosted its Hall of Innovators Awards. The awards honor Yukoners who are improving the lives of others with their innovative spirit and contributions. Van Campen doesn't know who nominated her, but thinks it was because she's part of a male-dominated field. So I think the innovation comes from bringing a new perspective, new um, 
skills, point of view, background, uh, diversifying an industry that could probably use it. It was a, it was a surprise. <laughs> Mita Williams is the co-owner of Long Ago People's Place, a Southern Deshoney interpretive camp and traditional museum in Champaign. For 26 years, the camp has been connecting visitors with Southern Deshoney culture. The Little Salmon Carmax First Nation citizen and her partner were also recognized for their work and were presented with the Notable Innovators Award. I was extremely grateful and, and being recognized um, after 26 years of um, replicating uh, traditional uh, shelters with the use of natural resources and, and bringing that forward. Um, it's been a long journey. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Congrats to the inductees. Speaking of awards, the Canadian Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences unveiled their list of nominees this morning. And new to the Junos this year, there are now two Indigenous categories. The traditional Indigenous Artist or Group of the Year category, the nominees are Kaki K by Fawn Wood, Singing is Healing by Joel Wood, Manitou Mukwa Singers 2 for their album by the same name, for Angel Eagle, Cree Round Dance Songs by the group Young Spirit, Nangijigun by Nimki in the Ninis, in the new category this year, Contemporary Indigenous Artist or Group of the Year, the nominees are When the Magic Hits by Adrian Sutherland, War Club by DJ Shub, J. Lee Wolf for Wild Whisperer, Shawnee Kish for her album of the same name, and the Snotty Nose Reds Kids for Life After. This year's Juno Awards are at the Budweiser Centre in Toronto, Ontario, Sunday, May 15th. You can watch them live on CBC TV. Great list of nominees there. Well, in the span of one month this year, a total of nine people died in house fires on First Nations in Alberta, Manitoba, and Ontario. Tonight on a new episode of Face to Face, Blaine Wiggins of the Aboriginal Firefighters Association of Canada shares some fixes he hopes would help extinguish the problem. Two very simple fixes that, that would address moving forward is uh, all First Nations homes uh, be built with uh, uh, hardwired uh, smoke alarm smoke detectors and that they be sprinkled, sprinkled. Uh, and that, that would solve a huge amount of problems moving forward uh, versus us trying to figure out how to keep uh, band-aiding that solution. You can catch that entire interview with Blaine Wiggins on Face to Face right here in less than two minutes time and be sure to tune in tomorrow live at 3 p.m eastern time for in focus host melissa ridgen will introduce us to the woman who last month filed a lawsuit against the manitoba government and a child welfare agency that's all the time we have for today's show i'm dennis ward thanks for being with us stick around face to face is next have a great night